Hello, everyone, and welcome to MICE, the Massachusetts Independent Comics Expo. I'm Shelley Paroline, the co-director of MICE, and this workshop is called Storyboarding for Animation. Before we get started, I want to take a minute to thank our sponsor for this program, Loop Animation, which offers premium online animation courses for aspiring filmmakers. Their course library includes hundreds of videos and video lessons that will show you what you need to know start to start animating, even if it's your first time. During this session, we'll be giving away two all access passes to Bloop Animation. So if you want a chance to win, all you have to do is right now tape, type your name into the chat and stick around until the end. And thanks to all of our arts advocates. These are major contributors who help sustain MICE and allow the show to grow year after year. MICE is produced by the Boston Comics Arts Foundation, a 501c3 charitable organization that funds comic arts festivals, individual artists, and educational programs for the greater Boston community. If you like what we're doing here, please consider making a donation today. You can just use the donate button at the bottom of this session. So also at the bottom of the screen, you'll see a button labeled ask a question. You can use that button to ask or vote up any questions you may have during this session. Also, you'll see that there's a chat box in the right hand screen. That's where we asked you to put in your name if you're interested in winning the giveaway. Um, and also, if everyone can just say hello, we'd love to know who we're drawing with today. Um, we'll also be streaming this panel to our Facebook page that is facebook.com slash M-I-C-E X-P-O. And that is for audience members who would like to use the automatic closed captioning function that Facebook Live offers. If you're choosing to work along with us today, you can share your art with us through our MICE photo booth. When it is time, we'll be sharing a link to the photo booth at the bottom of the screen, and you can just click to attach a file or take a photo with your webcam and share your work. And now I'd like to introduce our instructor, Andrew Ristaino. Oh, Ristaino, sorry. That's he is... Up. Great. <laughs> He's an Emmy Award winning designer and storyboard artist known for his work on Adventure Time and Midnight Gospel. He has also written and drawn several graphic novels, including an upcoming collaboration with Mice's own Jason Viola. Science Comics, The Digestive System is slated to be released in early 2021. So look for that. He has also given lectures at colleges and seminars around the world and most recently has taught at the Rhode Island School of Design. So thank you, Andy, and please take it away. Cool. Thanks, Shelly. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, yeah, I'm Andy Rostino. Um, so I got a talk prepared in a workshop kind of experiment that we can all do together and hopefully it'll go well. Um, I just want to say up front, there's a worksheet you can download, uh, but it's not necessary. You can just use paper and pencil and uh, it's just like a, a little template for storyboard panels because uh, there will be moments during the talk where I'll ask you guys to draw something. And if you want, you can draw along and, and, and try to do some storyboards yourself. Um, yeah, but you don't need the template. You can uh, just draw rectangles. It's, it's maybe even easier to do that. So uh, yeah, so I'll, I'll start the talk. All right. Um, yeah, so you want to make an animation. And you have a general idea of what it is. Uh, let's say you've even written a script. But what's the best way to translate that onto the big screen? Uh, you can just go ahead and animate it. But what if the story doesn't work? Or you didn't plan it out well? There's a lot that can go wrong. Uh, if only there's a way to figure it all out before committing your work to film. There is. The best way to plan out your animation is to make a storyboard. And uh, what is a storyboard? Well, a storyboard is basically a series of sequential images and directions that communicate story, character, movement, rhythm, emotion, composition, lighting, timing, and even sound to the viewer. viewer. So uh, it's an efficient and accurate way to test your ideas and gauge audience reaction before making the final product. Uh, a storyboard is pretty much a blueprint for your animation. Uh, do you need to be good at drawing to be a good storyboarder? The answer is no. Uh, these are all, I think, can work as storyboards. You know, they're all very simple. Uh, but 
you just need to be able to communicate your ideas and your vision. Uh, these storyboards are actually drawn by Martin Scorsese for his uh, movie, I'm blanking on the name. It's a boxing movie, it's in black and white, Raging Bull. Uh, and he did his own storyboards and he just kind of like made the basic, uh, you know, it's just something to remind him what he's about to shoot. So, uh, and that's pretty much all storyboards are. Uh, you know, they just need to be good enough to communicate your vision. But, uh, you know, having good drawing skills and understanding storytelling and story structure can dramatically help you get your ideas across. So, you know, if you look over here, you know, you can see like, if you know how to draw and, and do shading and stuff, you can do lighting effects or create, you know, if you understand perspective uh, or how to draw the figure, uh, you know, like it, it just helps to emote and, and to get across the emotions you're trying to share you know, or the danger or whatever, you know, like good drawing skills help, but they're not necessary. Um, you know, a good storyboarder combines uh, the vision of a director, the skill of a designer, the eye of a cinematographer, and the abilities of an actor. And uh, storyboarding is a lot of work. Um, I, I can tell you, I've done it myself, and uh, it's definitely one of the hardest jobs I've ever had. Um, and the bulk of storyboarding isn't just coming up with ideas and presenting them. It's about working with other folks to refine and revise an idea till it works. There's a lot of redoing and throwing away. And, and uh, you know, when you're storyboarding, um, well, uh, one of the hardest and most important skills to have as a storyboarder is not getting attached to your ideas. It's really easy to get caught up and be like, oh, this is my idea. And now uh, this is, I want it this way. And uh, it's really hard to let go of your ideas because you might not, someone might have a better idea. And usually it takes a few drafts to get to a point where everything's working. You know, it's, like, it's just like writing basically. Uh, and uh, you know, most of your first idea, ideas will end up in the trash bin by the time you have a board that works. So, oh, so uh, we're gonna dive into the deep end and make a storyboard with uh, no prepping. So uh, I, now is the time to uh, grab your uh, um, your template if you have it, if you have printouts, or if you're working on the computer, you can work directly on this, um, or you can just make some rectangles as many as you need. And uh, what we're going to do is we're going to pick out a scenario, uh, and I just wrote up a few here, just something to start with, like a nugget or an idea you can kind of roll with, and uh, you can make up your own if you want. But basically what we're going to be doing today is we're going to be taking these scenarios and rehashing them a few times. So pick something you want to spend some time with. And um, then, uh, yeah, so, so maybe take a minute and think about your scenario and think about what you want to do and kind of visualize um, what you're going to do. And then we're going to just do a really quick, we're going to do a thumbnail board and, and this is what you call a, a vomit pass, where you just kind of like, you get your idea and you're just gonna, bleh, you kind of throw it up and it doesn't have to be good. It can be ugly, it can be simple. Uh, you just have to get something to like, transpose your idea from here onto the paper. And um, yeah, so uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna be silent for a minute and then, we're going to do a five minute boarding pass. And that doesn't seem like a lot of time because it's not a lot of time. And, uh, but it's okay. It doesn't have to be good. Just try to race through it and get your idea down. It doesn't even have to be like, it could be, you could just draw six panels or however much you think you need to get the, the story on paper. So, all right. So I'm going to be quiet for one minute and then uh, we will. I, I will check back in and tell you guys to start drawing. You can start drawing now if you want. And uh, yeah, I might talk a little bit while, while you're boarding. So, so one minute.
Okay, so everyone should start drawing now if you haven't already. And uh, I'm going to set my timer for five minutes. And uh, hopefully you picked your what you want to focus on. Uh, I might do a little doodling and a little talking uh, while you guys draw. And um, yeah, so uh, basically when you're boarding, you know, even if you're like, you could choose, you don't have to do like a whole movie here. You can do one scene or sequence basically. And uh, sequence is basically like, uh, you know, a part of whatever idea you have, which is to film or something, you know, it could be like a guy getting out of bed and leaving his house, you know, it has a sequence and that leads into the next thing that happens, uh, you know, so, but when you're boarding something you want to make you want to try to have you know like even if it's a simple scene like someone's brushing their teeth you want to try to have a beginning a middle and an end to it you know so uh let's just while we're going i'm just going to do a little three panel thing maybe more it might end up being more but you know so it'll be like Someone standing here. And look, this is terrible. Uh, you know, not a great drawing. But we're just let these are thumbnails, so they don't have to be good. So it's someone maybe groggy. I don't know, that's a bad face. But looking in the mirror, there's a toothbrush over here. Uh, we cut to like a uh, close up of the toothbrush hand comes in and uh, grabs the toothbrush. There's a mug. So a hand comes in, pulls the toothbrush out, and they're brushing their teeth. This is the most boring thing ever. Um, And uh, spice it up a little. Let's see, something, a dark shadow comes up behind them. Holy moly. Rises up. Holy moly, there's a lot of panels. So we do a close up of their eyes, startled. Um, yeah, let's get to the, do one more panel maybe. And. I turn around and look. Brush in their mouth. Here's the uh, dark shadow. And it's a dog. who's in line to brush his teeth. I know that doesn't make any sense, but it's okay. This is just our first pass. I was trying to have some ears up here. Yeah, so just you know, get your idea down on paper and uh, whoop, where is that? Hold on. I lost my place. Here. 
here we are. All right, so pencils down or whatever. And uh, yeah, so let's take a look at stuff. You saw that thing I drew while you guys were drawing. That only took me five minutes. Um, yeah, I reaches for a toothbrush, brushes his teeth, shadow comes up behind him. He's startled, turns around, looks, there's a dog. Uh, but as part of the talk, I did another, oh, I did another board in the talk. And this was specifically just as simple as I could make it. So, and I chose burning building. Uh, where is it? Burning building. So here's a building. Oh, here's a shadowy figure again. I guess this is a theme of mine. Walks in, looks around, pours gasoline all over the building, lights it on fire. Holy moly, arson. Ah, scary. So I guess there's a beginning, middle, and end. It's so simple, it's just one shot. Um, not the most interesting thing, not the most interesting angle. Um, I uh, could have done something more complicated, but I wanted to start out with something really simple. So when we start to add uh, some more to these boards, uh, you can really see the difference. You know, like I think this works well enough as it is. It's it's basically a shot, so it's it's not really a. I mean, I guess it could be a sequence, but I guess this is more like a Wes Anderson sequence. It's very far away, uh, so you don't get to really know the character in it. Uh, you just know he's up to mischief. Um, you know, but it could be better, of course. So uh, let's break down how humans look and process the worlds around them. So uh, let's say you walked up and looked out, out a window and looked outside, right? Uh, what's the first thing you focus on? You know, the house next door, uh, or the trees, or probably you probably take in the fact that you're in a neighborhood, right? That's the first thing you get when you look. But eventually you might start to notice littler things, you know, like this squirrel over here, or this gnome in the bushes there, you know, or a baby in the chimney up, up at the top there. Um, you know, and uh, we kind of look at things from big things to little things. Uh, we kind of translate the world. So take, we assess the situation and then we have time to focus on smaller things. You know, and I think that's a survival technique. But uh, in film and animation, we actually emulate this process be and behavior by using something called a shot. And this is something I talked about while I was boarding. And I'm sure a lot of you already know what a shot is, you know, but, uh, you know, shots are basically different types of compositions used to establish things like location, feeling, and mood. Um, and here are some different type of shots. So I'm just going to go through and talk about shots. And, uh, you know, one thing to start with is the establishing shot. So uh, this establishes the setting for the sequence or the scene, you know, answers the question, where are we in location, time, and orientation? Typically, it's a wide shot that's placed at the beginning of a scene. So it could be interiors. Uh, this is from Nausicaa. Uh, here's the Simpsons house. You know, that's a good establishing shot. You know you're at the Simpsons house. Uh, this is the city in Z Zootopia. Uh, here's SpongeBob's house. And, you know, like it can't include a character in there. You know, like we know the characters in there. So uh, um, SpongeBob's at home or leaving home. Uh, it's wide or long shots. Uh, and that means the whole body of the character can be seen, but it's not filling the screen. So you get some of the environment and then you get characters interactive. You can see where they're going, what they're doing. You know, the subject is still relatively small in relation to the environment. Uh, the important thing is you can see the character in relation to their environment and kind of get a picture of everything that's going on around them. Uh, and maybe things that are about to happen to them, too. Uh, you know, like on this one, you can see they're coming through this doorway and they're probably going to go talk to this guy up there. Um, full shots. These are closer shots. So we're kind of zooming in. These are usually whole body sh shots. And uh, so the body of the subject can be seen, but it's filling more of the screen. The camera is close enough to capture the 
subject's basic appearance, you can kind of learn more about the characters. Um, you know, what they're feeling or thinking, what they're wearing, uh, you know. Um, yeah, it's a good, you know, like a long shot, it gives you a lot of information, basically. Uh, from there, we can go to medium shots. Uh, this frames the characters mostly from the waist up. It's a good all-purpose shot, you know, um, helps glue together separate shots. And it's great for dialogue scenes because you're, you're like close enough to see the characters' faces and their expressions, but far enough away that you can see two characters interacting with each other and, um, uh, yeah, and see their arms move and see them pose out and stuff like that. So. Uh, then we start getting closer, so close-ups. Uh, and these are, uh, you know, really close on something so you can show greater detail. Usually it signals that something important is happening, more emotional and intimate. Uh, so you can really get into the emotion of the characters, basically whatever they're going through. Uh, you know, whether it's concentration or fear or anxiety uh, or something else. Um, you know, and then another all-purpose shot is an in-shirt shot. So uh, this is like a cut in on a detail. It helps like emphasize the importance of an action by focusing on a detail uh, and clarifies the scene. Uh, you can kind of put these in anywhere, kind of like they're they're great. Like if there's a lot going on, like if you have an action scene and someone's like gonna take something out of their pocket, or and at the same time their shoelaces are untied, so and they're about to trip over their shoes. You can do a cut in shot of them taking something out of their pocket and cut to their shoes as they're about to step on their shoelace. And you can kind of like tie together all these loose ends to a shot. And uh, uh, I don't know, I, I, I kind of love insert shots uh, because they help, they help you kind of tell the story that you want the viewer to tell, to keep, see. Like you make sure the viewer sees what you want them to see basically. So. Uh, so let's uh, apply some of this stuff to our scenario. So we're gonna do another pass on our scenario, um, but this time uh, we're gonna see if we can approve it. You know, now that you have some time to sit with it, you've probably thought a little bit more about it. You can keep shots if you want. Uh, you can throw shots away. I, I suggest taking a new piece of paper out and, and starting over. And if you wanna keep a shot, just redraw it quickly, you know? And uh, what we're looking for is, you know, we want to start with an establishing shot to kind of anchor where we are and you know try to give us some information and you can take your scenario and add more to it or expand it or uh, uh yeah and then you want to add you know it, you don't have to have all these shots but just try to add some in if you haven't already you, you know your first pass you might have already put some of these shots in um but uh, yeah, establishing shot, wide shot, a full shot, medium shot, close up, and insert shot. So uh, yeah, uh, think about what you want to change, and then um, uh, we're gonna do another five minutes on this, and I might give you a little bit of extra time on it also. But yeah. Um, Shelly, do we have anything in the uh, the photo booth? And did anyone submit anything from the first pass? We do. Yeah, let's take a look at that. All right. Mm -hmm. I am not seeing anything. No, that's okay. Just grabbing it. Okay. <laughs> Sorry to startle you. Yeah, no, that's okay. Uh, we have a great one here. What are the What are your thoughts on moving from comics to making storyboards? I or, mean, yeah, okay, and, and they're just wondering, like, or even, you know, doing with both, both of those works at the same time, like you do. Is it okay. easier or more difficult? And what is a, as a cartoonist, would you have to unlearn? Uh, I mean, I think they're very similar and, and incredibly different. It's kind of, uh, I don't feel like I've, I've, you know, I've done a lot of storyboarding, but I, I don't feel like I've done enough to, to really have a good handle on how it's different. But I, uh, 
I will say uh, with comics, at least the comics I like to make, comics, I feel like is kind of about like editing things out, you know, like you try to um, less is more. And I feel like less is more also in storyboarding, but in comics, it's like, you, I think when I make comics, I try to think of like, do I need this shot? Can I cut it? What, like, how can I say what I want to say with the least amount of panels? Um, and then with storyboarding, you, you really have to think about like, since you're dealing with actual movement and, uh, and actual time, like real time, not like in comics, a lot of the time happens between the panels. So you don't see the time, but in storyboarding, you're trying to communicate actual motion and action. And, and so a lot of times you have to put in those drawings, especially in animation. Like if, if someone's doing all this movement, you have to include it um, because, well, you can leave it to chance and be like, well, I'm, I'm just gonna rough this in and I'll let the animators do it. But if you have something you really wanna, a feeling for how this character should move or behave, or uh, you really should elaborate on it in the board. Uh, so the animators know exactly how to translate what you want, basically. So I, I feel like with storyboarding, you really have to add a lot more detail and a lot more information. So, yeah. Uh, I see we have That's some- That's great. That, yeah, we yeah. also have some photo booth submissions. Cool. Excellent. So this looks like uh, from Patrick Lugo. This is the, uh, can everyone see that? Is that? Yeah, okay. Um, thank you. The, uh, he looked like he picked the burning building also. And we've got an establishing shot already. And this is a uh, something we'll get into in a second, but it's a low angle shot. So we're looking up at the building smoking. Uh, and then we pan up the side of the building here and we see a person in the window and uh, looks like we cut in closer and we see a kid looks worried looking down out the window and uh, we see how high up he is. We see the cars going by. Like, these are great. These are awesome shots you've chosen. Uh, and then uh, turning around, see what's be behind them. And then we see there's a uh, mother and children behind. And I'm not sure exactly what's happening, but they look worried. And I'm not sure what's going to happen next. Uh, but yeah, I think it's interesting. I think there's some moments where you can clarify things a little more. Um, or, it, you know, I, I just think with the six panels, um, I know we didn't have a lot of time to do this. But, uh, you know, with the six panels, um, I don't know. Yeah, it could have used a few more panels in there just to like, uh, you know, especially with this last shot to to define what's happening. But yeah, I think overall, that was really cool, Patrick. Uh, this is from uh, Sabrina Ruiz, or Ruiz, I'm not sure. Um, and so this is a sketchbook. So this is simple and it's kind of hard to read, um, but it looks like going to the supermarket. Oh, our five minutes are up. I'm gonna let you guys work for a little bit longer, maybe another minute. And uh, let me see if I can figure out what's going on with the storyboard. Um, yeah, I'm having trouble reading this one. I'm sorry, Sabrina. Uh, but maybe after this is done, I can look it over. Uh, or you can take a, a more flat on picture of it. Uh, but cool, good work. I like that you're just, you're going at it. Like, this is great. I like that you have, uh, you know, like you're just throwing down your ideas and, and putting in the words and like, this is a great first pass and something you can look over and, and define more later. Um, but, but yeah, let's, uh, let's stop our drawings and uh, let's check in and see kind of where we're at on our boards. So uh, yeah, and of course, uh, if you wanna submit uh, your pictures for me to look at, a little bit later. Uh, Shelly, how do they do that again? They have a link to share your work at the bottom of the screen. 
and that brings you to our photo booth. Okay, cool. So let's let's come back to the talk. And uh, so I'm going to go back to my thing. So this was my first pass at my burning building. And as you can see, it's one shot. It's very simple. Um, and there's not much going on. It's a little boring. Uh, so I decided to take the, the looking through the window thing from the thought experiment earlier and uh, apply it to this shot. So, so we start with a guy sitting down on the couch reading a book in his apartment. Uh, all of a sudden, everything shakes. There's a loud explosion. <sighs> Turns and looks. Gets up, goes over the window, looks out. You see a burning building. So this is the burning building shot from the other. This is the only shot I reused. Uh, and then in the window, there's somebody in the window waving. And we zoom in and we see it's a mother and child in the flames. Smoke's coming out of the window. They're trapped. What's going to happen? Uh, we cut back to the guy in the window. It's a reaction shot. He's worried. Uh, yeah, and that's pretty much what I did. And for these, I kind of took approximately five to 10 minutes to do this, you know, so uh, uh, not too much longer than what you guys had to do your second pass. And um, yeah, as you can see, this is an establishing shot here. Uh, a cut in to a uh, medium shot. Uh, then this would be this guy heart hurries into frame, we see the window. And you know, you do things where like in the establishing shot, you kind of want to establish where everything is. So you've got the window here. Uh, you've got the guy on the couch, you kind of establish the space. Uh, cut to his point of view shot from looking through the window, he sees the building on fire, then cut in uh, close up not a close up, but a uh, full shot on uh, characters in the window in the building, burning building, and then a reaction shot of uh, the character reacting to what he's seeing. And so you kind of like get him looking and then reacting. So it's kind of uh, just in those three shots, it's a beginning, middle, and end of a thought, basically. Um, yeah, so I. Definitely an improvement on my first uh, pass, but uh, intentional improvement though. I made the first my first pass really simple, so I could really uh, pump, pump it up a little on the second pass. Um, yeah, and then there's some more shots we can talk about. So uh, these are kind of more extreme shots that you can use to heighten the viewer's experience. And um, well, you know, we're not going to be able to go through everything about storyboarding in this talk. There's so much to storyboarding that uh, I just wanted to handle the basics for this. So, uh, so like an over the shoulder shot, it means the camera's placed just behind one of the characters looking over their shoulder. And uh, it's more intimate. It puts the audio audience like they're as like they're part of the conversation, you know, like you're hanging out right behind one of the characters. You can see both their reactions, even though one's not facing you. Um, it's a good shot to use. Uh, these are more, these are extreme wide shots. Uh, these are used to make subject feel extra small or to make things feel extra grand. Uh, these, these plenty of times establishing shots are used as, uh, I mean, ex extreme wide shots are used as establishing shots. Um, you know, they can evoke feelings of isolation, distance, and grandeur. Um, and the opposite is the extreme close-up, and that's a tight shot that frames only a small area or detail of the subject. And, and you know, these are kind of like uh, uh, cut-in shots. Um, and a lot of times they can show like intense emotional duress, like characters under, or uh, you can do cool things like where it, it, you've got the eye and then you see the reflection in the eye of somebody doing something. Uh, intense emotion. Great to use an extreme close up. Or you can use it to show how disgusting someone's head is, like SpongeBob does. Uh, you know, I, it kind of like lets you see things differently than how you normally would, too. Like it kind of takes you out of uh, your normal headspace because you have to look at things from a different perspective than you normally would see. You're usually not this close up to people. Um, 
there's the point of view shot. It's the first person shot. So what you're seeing, what the character is seeing. So this is uh, from Toy Story. This is Woody's getting cleaned up, I think, in Toy Story 2. And uh, so I, this is a big Q-tip. Uh, this is a point of view shot from inside a mouth. And uh, yeah, great for reactions and drama, showing a new per perspective. Like you can kind of, when a point of view shot starts, uh, you can say this is from the viewpoint of the character you're looking through their eyes. So it's great to show a character's point of view and you can show stuff differently from what reality is because you're filtering it through someone's eyes. So if you have like a character that's an unreliable narrator, um, you can show things differently through a point of view shot. Uh, and it's a great way to kind of like give new information or give wrong information if you want. Uh, low angle shot, it's an upshot. It makes a camera position anywhere below the up line, the eye line pointing upwards. I uh, can make a subject appear more powerful, heroic, imposing. Uh, you know, increase perceived height, make them more intimidating. Uh, and the opposite of that is a high angle shot or a down shot. You look down on the subject, so it makes the character feel small and inferior. It's also known as the God view. You know, like this one is like a shot from the ceiling looking down and uh, you'd have to be floating to get that shot, you know, but you can use these to make a character feel small uh, or troubled or inferior. Uh, the Dutch angle is something that's used a lot. That's when the camera is tilted, so there's no kind of flat perspective uh, uh, with a frame that isn't level. And a lot of times people use that uh, to give a psychological impact of full shot. It conveys disorientation and instability and uh, uneasiness. And uh, yeah, so this is a good one to kind of mix things up and let you know that something weird is happening in the movie, you know, or if you're filming the first Thor movie, you can use it for every shot. So, uh, uh, but, uh, so let's go back into our scenario and do one more time. Let's, but this time we're gonna try another thing. We're gonna try to change the genre of the, uh, of the board. So uh, we're gonna go through using some of these new shots and old shots and let's, let's redo the board. And uh, this time we're gonna turn it into an action scene. So we wanna use some of these extreme shots and low angles, high angles, um, you know, Dutch angles, uh, point of view shots. And uh, you know, we can use the old ones too and you can save stuff from your old board. You can start over again. Um, I'm gonna give you guys uh, 10 minutes with this one, just cause this is gonna take a while or actually let me hold on i'm going to give you eight minutes and uh you might not finish because uh action is tough because you have to tie everything together so let's start now and uh yeah i'll talk and i'll probably look at some more boards and uh um but yeah like think about the action and think about how you connect action together and make make it make sense to the viewer. Like one thing you're trying to, one of the big things that Storyboarder struggles with is trying to keep things clear. Like even if you're doing a scene that's disorienting or a lot is going on, the viewer still has to follow what's happening in the film and understand what's, what's happening, you know, understand the space and the movement. And, uh, you know, sometimes you can use that against the viewer. And if you really want to disorient them, you can flip shots and, uh, you know, do things out of sequence or um, leave out information. But most of the time, if you've watched like an act, action movie, like the, I don't know, the Mission Impossible movies or James Bond, like a lot of quick cuts and a lot of action happening, uh, a lot of crazy stuff going on. So uh, yeah, let's look at uh, some more boards though. Uh, this is from Braden and uh, So this is a, uh, which one did he pick? Is this dinner table? I forget what the list was. So I'm sorry about that, everyone. And, uh, but, okay. The silent 
Dunes table. I'm not sure what that word is, but it's got cats on one side, dogs on the other. And look at, this is cool. So, you know, we don't have a lot of time. So just to get the idea across, this is something we actually did on Adventure Time a lot, is you just draw the silhouette of a thing and you're like, oh, characters here, characters here. This side is all cats, this side is all dogs. <laughs> and sometimes this would, like shots like this would even go to, uh, go to uh, the animation house to be animated and they'd have to, we'd give them character designs of who these characters are and we'd label character one, character two, character three. And uh, they would, uh, they would have to figure it out, you know, because a lot of times you don't have time to finish a board in a great amount of detail. Cat staring, slight distance. Dog realizes cat staring. So we've got the cat staring and then we cut to the opposite. See the dog realizing, close up of cat, cat's eyes narrow. Close up of dog, dog grimaces ambiguously. Like you're not sure what's going on in that dog's head in this panel and then smiles happily. So we got a nice little surprise here. Yeah, this is fun, the very clear storytelling, I think. And uh, a fun little surprise uh, button at the end. Uh, pretty cool, nice work. Uh, do we have any more questions? We do. We actually have a few about um, camera shots. Maybe okay. these are quick answers. Yeah, let's look. So someone asked, um, if you're drawing a scene that's in media res, is an establishing shot still necessary? And I have another good one too. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's always nice to have, I feel like it's always nice to establish what's going to happen. And a lot of times establishing shots, you know, like when you enter a new area, you want to establish where things are, um, especially like with this thing we're doing now with the action. Uh, one of the important things with action, you want to know where everything is. So, um, and then what was the second part? So uh, they're curious if the establishing shot is necessary, like in that. And then there's another good question where it's, um, when there's a voiceover talking about a scene in a certain panel, would that uh -huh. panel be considered an insert shot or an established shot? So you're saying a voiceover over something else. So it depends on what mm -hmm. you're seeing in the panel. So let's say we took uh, this scene with the dogs and cats sitting at the table. If there was someone talking over this panel, this would still be an establishing so shot. It would just have voiceover over it. Um, but if we, an insert shot is mostly like a, it's like a close up on something. So, uh, you know, just to give you a little snippet of some action or something you need to notice, you know, um, it's happening that might not be apparent from a, a f scene that's further out. So, uh, yeah. Do you want to go to the next board? Okay, this is Cave Explorer by Cosmo G. Um, so it looks like somebody's in a cave. And then uh, sound effects. I can't tell, does it say flame fire voice? Or it's, uh, maybe it's just a flame getting turned on. So we got a little hand lighting a flame and a lantern. And uh, the area lights up. The guy looks around. We cut wider to see kind of where they are. This is like the opposite of us. So we don't get the establishing shot till it's revealed to the character. And that's a really interesting way to handle it. You know, like you're in darkness and then the light reveals where they are. So kind of the point of this shot is to see that the character doesn't know where they are and you don't either. And then the character looks around and says, wow, it's huge here. So yeah, that's a fun little sequence. Um, yeah, next one. <laughs> Dead body reported. Okay, so we got a little guy looking out a window with a broken beams or something. And there's a little, maybe they're in an attic or something. A little guy comes in through the trap door. And then he cuts the other guy in half, it looks like. 
And then he jumps back in through a great. Oh, so that's a grate in the floor. That's not a trap door. And then there's a body, half a body guy comes in, sees this and is startled, turns around, there's more over here. So um, yeah, I think this, this one is generally, um, it's simple and it's confusing. I feel like a lot of times uh, this might be great for you to remember what you're doing, but you need a little more, like it would be nice to have some notes down here about what's happening in the panels. Um, you know, uh, like this could totally work if you had a little bit of a, you know, not like dialogue, but a little bit of a, um, just more information, you know, like ninja pops in through great. Uh, yeah, it looks like this guy's trying to escape too. So it'd be one thing to have, you could have like an establishing shot of styling, like, if this is someone in a prison or, or trapped in a room or that they're trying to escape or they're trying to nail up boards, like I'm, I'm just not sure what's happening. Um, so before this character pops in, it would be nice to have like something establishing what's going on in the room before their presence is made known. Okay, uh, so we've run out of time for that drawing. So stop drawing your action sequence and uh, so I did an action sequence too, based on my other one. And it's a little bit, I just want to warn you up front. It's a little bit of a mess. I didn't get enough time to work out all the kinks on this action sequence, but I wanted it to be kind of the equivalent of what you guys are doing for this uh, exercise. So um, yeah. Um, and just before I go through this, uh, we're going to have a few minutes after I go through this to answer questions. So if you want to ask more questions, uh, ask them now and we can get through as We probably won't have time to get through that many, but we'll get through as many as we can before the thing is over. Um, so yeah, so we start out with a guy in the room. Same thing happens. The room shakes. We hear an explosion. Cuts close. He looks. He hears a voice. Some, someone's saying help. And we cut to a woman, a baby, and a room we hear fire. Another explosion. Their baby wakes up, starts crying. The woman's yelling, uh, help, someone help us. Please help us. And we zoom out, really quick zoom out. We see she's on the third floor of a burning building. Uh, cut back to the guy, it's a Dutch angle. He stands up, heroic pose, his eyes narrow with determination. Then we cut to outside the window looking in. Uh, this is the wall of the building. We see flames reflected in the, uh, in the window. And then through the window, we see the guy. And this is stuff like th these kind of details with a board this rough is stuff where it would be a good thing to write notes in because it's, I don't expect anyone to understand this but me. And I'm explaining it to everyone now. So you can probably see what I'm talking about. But without the notes, someone might look at this and get the wrong idea of what, the, what this is. So the guy starts running at the window and we, we cut to the side and he smashes through the window. And that's as far as I got with this one. It, uh, uh, yeah, I spent a lot of time trying to figure out shots to use and how to make it action. And I had all these big ideas and I just didn't even get to them. I didn't have enough time. And, uh, you know, this is an example of something where, you know, I would like to spend a lot more time with it because I would probably change a lot more of this and make it more coherent. Um, yeah, but, you know, like you've got, this is pretty much the same as the uh, original. And then we cut to this. This is a, um, a close up. Uh, and then we have a quick zoom out to a wide shot, establishing that they're in the building. Uh, and this is an establishing shot too. Uh, then we cut to a Dutch angle of the guy inside the building, standing up, extreme close up of his eyes. Um, and then this is a wide shot or a long shot. And so is this one. Uh, this might be a medium shot actually, but uh, yeah, 
you know, uh, I feel like a lot of times with action, you can do, you can go too far and make things le- like more confusing by choosing crazy angles. Um, and if we have, we're running out of time, but if we had more time, um, I had I had other plans for us to revise things. We were gonna try to take this idea and redo the whole board. Uh, oh, hold on. Again, but this time we'd switch the genre. So we do like a romance. How would we do this again in romance? How would we do this again as a, uh, you know, as a drama? How would we do this again as a, a uh, uh, film noir? You know, like it, it's kind of like the the thing you want to give to the audience uh, filters all the shots you pick, and I, I think it's just a good exercise to think about. Uh, how the scenario would change and how you could you could throw out stuff and be like okay this doesn't work for romance but if i take out these shots and add in new shots um you know uh things things can change um yeah but well it doesn't look like we're gonna have time to do another pass so uh yeah uh should we go over this last board yeah let's try it um, okay. So they can oh, post to, okay. to booth right now. Yep. Okay. We have a few more. Okay. So Sydney, this is underwater. So we've got that good establishing shot of uh, otter swimming through kelp, and you know you really get it. Like there's lots of depth of field here. You know there's kelp in the foreground and kelp in the background, and kind of make out the surface of the water, and you even get a sense of the lighting, uh, and with this really simple and super sketchy drawing so i that's great uh otter see something most perfect clam ever so that's great so we this is a uh we get into the character's head what they're looking at omg uh and there's looks like dizzy stars or excitement stars around them uh got it they get the clam Time to crack this sucker, bang, banging it on a rock. So I think this is generally great. I think here you could use a more panel showing them getting the item, uh, the clamshell, you know, like swimming towards it or something, something that shows, you know, establishing the distance between them in some way. So there could be some sort of connecting shot between these two and then a shot that shows this character, uh, you know, I, I, I know, I, I don't know if this is true in this sequence, but, you know, otters usually come up to the top of the surface and bang uh, the shells on a rock on the surface, I think. I mean, I'm, I don't know. I don't totally know for sure. I'm not an otter expert. So, um, but you could show a shot of the surface and then the otter coming to the surface if that was the case. Uh, but yeah, great job. Uh, do we have questions? Should we go to a question first? We do have some good questions. Okay. And you talked about how um, adding a description or notes is yeah. very helpful. Is there some other bits of common feedback that you get on your storyboards, like from directors that you'd want to share? Sure. I mean, a lot of things, you know, working in TV, you don't have that much time to uh, get, you're dealing with a large amount of time in a short amount of time. I, I don't know, that doesn't make it much sense. But uh, like Adventure Time, when I first started boarding on Adventure Time, we were doing boards in four weeks. And I would always, it would always take me an extra week to finish a board because I was always a little behind. And uh, the first week we would do the, a rough pass, a thumbnail pass. And it would be two people doing a thumbnail pass. And uh, that's 11 minutes. So we each be doing like uh, five and a half minutes. And uh, roughly and and that's a lot of time to cover storyboarding in a week and a lot of times you just don't have time to hook everything up and so a note i would get a lot is like hook up they just leave a post-it note that said hook up and that just means you want to make these shots basically what i was talking about with the otter thing where it's like this sequence doesn't make sense because we're missing a part and so hook up means hook them together and make sure they match like where the characters are standing and where they are in the room. And, and sometimes you need to add a new shot in and stuff like that. Um, trying to think of other things. 
I got a lot. Um, you know, a lot of times they just cut whole, you do this whole sequence and spend a lot of time on it and it's just not what they want or it doesn't work for the episode or, you know, like usually the episodes have like an emotional core to them and you might fall in love with like a Rube Goldberg sequence that you created for this one thing to happen and it's really elaborate and uh, and they're like, this is completely unnecessary. This is all getting cut. And you're like, ah! but but that's just kind of how it goes. And uh, and it, you know, with more experience, you start to really get a feel for what they want in a board for TV. And you're like, and then you start picking out the things that are wrong yourself and catching them before they even you even pitch them. Uh, yeah, another question. Yes, we do. Um, I'm going to tie these two together. Okay. Uh, professionally speaking, is there a common practice of drawing storyboards traditionally, or is there an expectation to do your storyboards digitally? And on that note, people would love some uh, recommendations on potentially like some storyboarding software for mm -hmm. high school students potentially okay. or anyone who's jumping in. Yeah. Um, so I, yeah, I mean, I think over the course that I have been in, I was in LA, uh, things changed quite a bit. When I got there at, on Cartoon Network, everyone was still was drawing on paper. All the boards were done on paper and post, people would note them up with post-it notes and draw over the drawings. And um, that was really neat to see everyone still working on paper. And then slowly over time, I think with newer shows, it's just so much easier to do it in the computer once you get used to using it. and uh, there's so many time-saving devices, like you can copy and paste backgrounds. You can do pans really easily. You can sync up stuff to sound. Um, in at Adventure Time, I did most of my work digitally because I was just used to working in the computer. And I was just working Photoshop with a bunch of layers, which is very inefficient. And then when I was working on Midnight Gospel, we did everything in a program called Storyboard Pro. Um, which I'm not sure how expensive it is. It might be pretty expensive. Um, and, but that is like, I taught myself how to use that in like a day. And, uh, you know, I didn't know that much about it, but I knew the stuff I need to know. And it's nice to have someone who knows a little bit about the program to show you shortcuts and stuff like that and hotkeys. Um, but it's, it's pretty easy to learn and uh, really amazing to use like, and, Midnight Gospel, we, the audio was from Duncan Trussell's podcast. A lot of it, I mean, they would add in other stuff too. And so they, they just give us a sequence with the audio and you would just board to the sequence. And it was really nice because you could like plan out your shots and, and, I, and you'd have sound to base it on, which when I was working on Adventure Time, we were writing, uh, Adventure Time was a, uh, a board driven show, which means you get an outline and the boarders are writing all the dialogue. And uh, so you are boarding before any voice acting has been done. And, uh, you know, that's a lot more work for the writers and the boarders uh, than having uh, this radio show that they're kind of cutting up and turning into a story. I mean, it's still a lot of work for the writers either way, but definitely for boarding, boarding was a lot easier on. Uh, Midnight Gospel and Adventure Time. And uh, as far as programs, Storyboard Pro is the only one I've really used. Um, there are probably some really good apps for I iPad Pros, stuff like that. I wish I knew which ones to recommend, uh, but I don't. I'm sorry. No, are that's we, great. Yeah. Are we out of time? We are out of time, unfortunately, but oh. uh, there's a lot of great questions people want to know. Yeah. Um, I mean, if you want some to, advice can, on storyboarding portfolios yeah. and where to put them. And, yeah. yeah. You can you can forward that to me and I can try to answer people's questions. So. Absolutely. And can we yeah. uh, share your Twitter handle? Yeah. Perhaps? Yeah. yeah. Should I do that right now? Oh, I gotcha. Oh, you got You're doing it right now. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay, great. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Andy. Of course. This was awesome. All right. So it's time to say goodbye, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, this is a part of the month of mice. Uh, it is our very last day. We're so sad to say goodbye to you all.
But if you'd like to order Andy zines, please find a link on our website by clicking at the button at the bottom of your screen. And congratulations to our giveaway winners, Jesse Bradley and Katie McMahon. We'll be in touch with you about your prize from Bloop Animation by email. This session is part of the month of MICE, a month of free comics program, including panel discussions and workshops. Today's our last day, as I said. But if you liked this workshop, uh, check out Creating Graphic Novels for Middle Grade Readers and workshops such as A Hero's Journey and Eight Panels with Summer Pierre. Those are still available to watch online. You can just replay them right in Crowdcast. For a full list of our sessions, visit micexpo.org or just click that button again down there. And if you didn't win the Bloop Animation Pass, you still have a chance. Check out our fundraising raffle where you can win a pass to Bloop and other cool prizes like Clip Studio uh, Paint, a Wacom drawing tablet, or a hunk of cheese. That's right. And <laughs> tickets just start at $1. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye.